assumed that that talk doesn't really exist. This is, this is the very conventional way of looking at the science and particularly the emissions, the bean counting, the bit that people always miss. <coughs> the science of climate change is all very interesting, but the bit that really matters is and actually the emissions. Because you can discuss the science of climate change with no emissions. But it's when you add the two together you get real problems. And that's what um, myself and my uh, colleague, uh, Alice Bowes, we've tried to do that. And we've tried to bring together the, the science on climate change and then very, very much the conservative science that's in, embodied in the um, IPCC reports, which does actually, doesn't actually factor in enough of these other sets of feedbacks. So as I said, this is a very conservative science we've used here, and we've allied that with the, um, the empirical emissions data that we actually have, what we have emitted, and then say something about where emissions are going and what we'd have to do with emissions. And that probably brings the, the whole story back to us. And it's not just about governments, actually, it's about, it's about us and about the sort of rates of change that we have to see from our behaviours. Mm -hmm. um, right, I want to go through one line, what is dangerous climate change, I'm not going about that particularly, but uh, um, just point out where some other, what some other people say about it. Look at cumulative emissions, that's the take home message, it's not about long term targets, they're irrelevant on climate, for climate change, my guess is that's where Obama sits, not sorry, he sits on long term targets I think, not cumulative emissions, and pretty much all governments think about long term targets, not cumulative emissions, but they're, they're unpopular way of thinking about things, you have to change things immediately, if think about it in a different way. And look at global greenhouse emission pathways, and I'll bring it back quickly to the UK, what that might mean for the UK. And remember, this is all quite optimistic, because it doesn't take account of these other sets of science that weren't embodied in this conservative IPCC report. So what is dangerous climate change? Well, I'm not have to go to that very thorny subject, because I can look to the U EU and the UK and define it as 2 degrees C, and that's basically, if we keep stuffing out CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, um, and the and the, the uh, temperature goes up. Um, if it goes up to two degrees C above the sort of global mean that it was prior to the Industrial Revolution, and we think that's just about the threshold between acceptable and dangerous climate change. That's their definition. That's got a very dodgy background to the two degrees C, and certainly for many people in the, uh, around the world, two degrees C is not just dangerous, it's deadly. But they're a long way away and they're poor, and we don't care. So if we're honest about it, we're saying that 2 degrees C is the threshold for wealthy people like us because we think we can probably adapt to it and just about survive with it and sob the rest. That's pretty good, but it's not Chatham it's Chatham House here, so you can't quote me on this. Um, <laughs> that's broadly what 2 degrees C, C says, that we think we can get by with it. We, we know that other people will die, and probably in Darfur, we're exacerbating the issues there already today. So people are probably dying from the 0 0.7, 0 0.8 we've seen already. But again, they're a long way away and very poor with no political influence. So that's dangerous climate change dealt with. Um, so what are the targets for this 2 degrees C, this magical figure? Well, if you look at the UK, it's something marginally out of date now because it looks like it's going to be 80% reductions in CO2 by 2050, possibly CO2E now. The EU has similar sort of targets, but the thing to note here, they're all about 2050. They're all about some time outside my term of office. Um, which is, I think, the principle behind this. Um, but CO2 stays in the atmosphere for somewhat longer than uh, a term of office. 100 years, actually considerably longer than that, as you point out, a lot of the feedback, a lot of the sinks now, they're already being affected. The Southern oceans aren't absorbing as, they, as we expect them to be absor absorbing, and that looks like it's a change that's come about um, 20, 30 years ahead of when we thought it would happen. So CO2 is staying in the atmosphere longer than it was previously, but if it does stay there that long, the, you know, this laptop, the lights in here, all the energy we're putting out, pumping out, or all this CO2 from the energy we're making, we're pumping out now, that will be here for another 100 to 200 years. And it will be added to, this talk today will be added to any talks in here tomorrow and by talks we here yesterday. So we're just accumulating the CO2 in the atmosphere. And if you think of it as accumulating, these long-term targets have, uh, are irrelevant. They have nothing to do with climate change. So I'm quite blunt about that. And the, the, I say, go as far as to say the final percentage reduction in CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions um, has nothing to do with climate change. I don't give a damn if it's 100% in 2050 or 1% in 2050. We could all go to 2049 and just before midnight, agree to switch all the lights off and not dry for 30 seconds, and the emissions would plummet to 80% below or even 100% below what they are now, have no impact on climate change. So the actual long-term targets are irrelevant. It's how you get there that matters. So it's cumulative emissions. Um, so how do temperatures link to budgets? And how from there can you go into pathways, which is about what we have to do? Um, well, if you think of, we can dial in the temperature. So we can say what temperature we think is dangerous in 2 degrees C, say, is the one that some people are using now. So you can put in two degrees C, and you can ask the clever folk, the science, scientists and the modelers, um, and they can give you um, a range, as in all good science, they'll see quite a reasonable range of what that would mean in terms of the amount of CO2 or other greenhouse gases. 
with the concentration of those in the atmosphere. So give you a temperature, they can tell you something about what that concentration might look like. They can then also, through some science and modelling, tell you something about how much, uh, the, how much of these greenhouse gases can you dump into the atmosphere over a period of time. So they can say something about the cumulative amount of CO2 that you can throw into the atmosphere, say, over the next 100 years. And that's more typically the time that scientists talk about rather than 2050. Often they go well beyond 100 years. But something like that. So what's, what's the amount we can put into the atmosphere in the next 100 years? And then you come to the social science part, I suppose. You say, well, how do we divide this cake, this global century-level cake, amongst the different nations. And if you, if you have an apportionment regime, apportionment regime and we've got uh, all three here today, so you can tell you a little bit about those. Obviously, contraction convergence would be one of the ones here. Some of us may argue it's the only one there, but anyway, there are, you, you split the cake in certain ways, and you can say something about what the national cumulative emission budget might look like. If you then say something about where we are today, we know what emissions are from 2000 to 2007 anyway, and you know something about short-term projections. I guess if any of you flew down here today, which I hope none of you did, if you did, you probably got a return flight, so you're unlikely to go back by bus. Um, so we can say something about the immediate future, regardless of how severe these talks are. So we know something about emissions today, tomorrow, and probably for the next four or five years. If you put all that together, you can then say something about what the global emissions pathway looks like, to bring you to two degrees C, or the national emissions pathway. So you can take it back up to that temperature. And that's the sort of work that Alice and I have been doing, just to give some, some sense of that. If this was your emissions out to 2100 and your CO2 up the side, then you could plot your recent emissions, we know what that is, and what matters here, this is your 60% or 80% targets, which are irrelevant, what matters is that stuff under the curve, it's the cumulative emissions under the curve that matters. So you know what emissions you've got now, we can say something about short term emissions to a peak, you could use the latest data out of the IPCC report, I take it, do you all know what the IPCC is? No, no, they're good, right? Um, so you can take that out of the latest AR4 in the IPCC, and that has a, a, quite a wide range of cumulative emissions um, with carbon cycle feedbacks, but a lot of the other feedbacks aren't back in there, for two degrees C. And therefore, if you've got that data, you can therefore draw the plot of what that emissions pathway might look like. Um, and you'll get a range, because there's quite a big range, as I'll show you a bit, a bit later, and the cumulative values for given temperatures. There's a lot of uncertainty there. The pol there's a policy certainty, but there's sci the scientific uncertainty, but there's absolute policy certainty that comes out of it. So you can, you can do something like that. Now, if you think of that way of looking at the issues, rather than this long-term target nonsense, um, what does that say about the global issues you've got to deal with? And then also I'll bring it back, back down very briefly to the UK. Let's look at it <coughs> from a global perspective. And this is what, uh, there's a paper that we had published in the Philosophical Transactions Journal um, of the Royal Society, which you can get off the web. If, ever, if any of you have problems getting it, sometimes you have to pay. The universities don't, but anyone else might have to pay. If you email, probably always email me. If you email, can we email the organisers here? Email the organisers here, and they will send out a PDF without my permission. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sending it. We're not allowed to send out one of the few. Um, so what are the latest CO2 emission trends? Um, which is absolutely central to this debate. I mean, if you, ask, if you ask most people who work on climate science what the CO2 emissions are, they wouldn't have a clue. They would probably get the order of magnitude right. Which shows you that actually the, you have to bring the scientists and the emissions bean counters together. But the bean counters are basically train spotters, and no one's interested in what train spotters have got to tell us. Which is why you find things like Stone Report, which have no idea of emissions, just guess the number of it. Um, so, what are the implications that are factoring in land use and forestry and also the non greenhouse gas emissions? And we'll go into those in the detail later. And then, when will emissions peak? When do we think we're going to max, you know, maximum CO2 or greenhouse gas emissions? So let's look, look at the emissions of the last, um, well, since the Industrial Revolution. This is very similar to David's slide here, basically. We've seen a 2.7% increase per annum in CO2 emissions over the last 100 years. Now, we, the Rio summit was 92, wasn't it? The other summit in Rio, I think, it was 1992. So clearly, since then, we've been really quite concerned about climate change, and particularly the last five years. So everything that number has come down, but the reality has gone up. Um, so that shows that, I mean, this is. I think this is where we've had all the rhetoric on climate change. How serious is climate change? How many of us here are flying more often than we were five years ago? I know it should be gone back to Sweden. No. Tut tut. <laughs> Let alone Seattle. Um, so, uh, I'm trying yeah. to walk on water, but it's not working. <laughs> no, but that's a real issue, actually. I mean, this comes down to we have to change our lives. And this afternoon, 